Emotions are good. They are not bad and they are not neutral. They are good gifts from God given to us to help us process a very messy world and to connect us to God in a deeper way and to connect us to each other in a deeper way. Because you know the real truth about confidence is that confidence doesn't come from thinking about it or wishing that you were more confident. It's all about taking action. Welcome to the show today. You're in the right place because we are in the bullseye of emotional health topics, talking to Jenny Allen, talking about how to untangle our emotions. Jenny and I share about how we both had an interesting emotional reaction with the pandemic and how we've invested in ourselves and our emotional health ever since. Now, after we talk with Jenny, it's time for coaching. Today, I'm adding to some past coaching sessions we've had on building confidence through the years. I want to go a little deeper on how you can build confidence in your life. This is something that we're going to revisit a few times a year because for us as women especially, intentionally building confidence is going to pay off not only for ourselves, but for the people around us for years to come. And for the final segment of the show today, I'm bringing you an update on a show that I had started. I want to tell you how it was at the end of the season and a new show that I'm absolutely loving. Now, I want to tell you that Called Creatives is actually open for new members right now. Hopefully, you did the challenge with us. Called Creatives is a coaching community where Lisa Whittle and I teach women to follow the calling to be writers and speakers. Some just want to write. That's fine. Some want to write and speak. That's fine, too. People are always surprised to learn that writing and speaking is a craft. It's not something people just do. Um, I will tell you, the Lord really pushed me into it kicking and screaming because I was a horrible writer and terrified to speak in front of people. <laughs> I was too shy to join the debate team in school. But luckily, when you feel called to do this work, God will equip you with the training and the help you need through the years. He definitely did with me. And that's why Lisa and I built Called Creatives. We want to take all of our experience. We've both been doing this for 15 years for me and 20 years for Lisa. We want to give you the step-by-steps on writing and speaking. We do it with monthly live coaching, mastermind groups. Lisa and I do a training and a teaching every week. Lisa and I have events. All of this for $29. It is embarrassingly inexpensive. So if you in any way, shape, or form feel like you might want to write a book one day, that you're interested in that, or you might feel called to speak in front of a mops group, you want to speak more effectively in your workplace, or you want to get up and preach, Come on now, Called Creatives is for you. Our goal is to give you the best training. You will not get training better than this for the least amount of money. That is our promise. It has been since day one, January 2020, and it continues that way now. We will give you the best training for the most affordable price. So go to calledcreatives.com. We are open, and we would love to have you join the community. And speaking of great authors and speakers, let's welcome my friend Jenny to the show. Jenny Allen, welcome back to the show, my friend. For everybody watching on YouTube, can we just admire Jenny's uh, fashion sense with that shirt? I was teasing her <laughs> before we started recording. Right. You look so cute. I love Thanks. it. Thanks. Okay. As an author, the idea of writing a book on emotions, here it is, Untangle Your Emotions, is terrifying because in my <laughs> mind, it's like writing about marriage. Um, everything's going to blow up while I'm writing it. You know, I don't know what it is about writing a book that makes your life blow right. up. What was it for you that made you figure out, okay, I want to write on this topic. I want to do this. And did you ever question that choice? Yeah, of course. I mean, but it was actually intimidating to me for a different reason. I was overwhelmed by the subject. It just felt so big and that every single person would be coming at it from a different perspective and direction. And yeah. some people consider themselves too emotional. Some people consider themselves not emotional at all. So I, I felt like the harder task was just how am I going to, you know, attach, attack this in a way that it's really helpful for people because it's such a big subject. It's like, this is just so big. Um, yeah. But of course, yeah, right when I started writing, my husband actually walked through his second kind of bout with depression and set me down. I mean, I was probably a month in to writing and and he said, you know, I feel like I'm kind of experiencing some of the things I did several years ago. And, and so that, I didn't see that coming. So that, that was under the whole six months to a year that I worked on, like actually writing the project. It was after the research part, but it was, yeah, it was a little overwhelming, but 
I, yeah, I don't think we ever will escape this subject anyway. <laughs> so I didn't feel like scared. It was, it would be more so. It just feels like this is just the tension of life, right? I mean, emotions are flying everywhere. Totally. I love it that you and Zach are so honest about what he went through with depression. Yeah. And you didn't try to sugarcoat it. I feel like we are coming out of the era where leaders felt the pressure to appear perfect from the outside that yeah. especially in the Christian space, if we're doing everything right, we're never going to deal with anxiety or depression or all of those mm -hmm. things. So I really want to commend you guys for that kind of honesty and vulnerability that you share. Yeah, with. I mean, certainly I was very raw as I always am. And then for him though, to allow me to write about it, I think was really brave and he want he insisted. I mean, it was important to him. Oh. He knew men would read this book. He knew um, people struggling with depression and anxiety disorders would read this book. And so he wanted his story told. And I was I was really proud of his attitude about all of it. And and even still, it's just it's really a gift to people. Did you learn anything about your husband that you didn't know before with him going? Well, it was fun um, to be in a new season in our marriage and in our lives where we'd already done so much work. So we've done a lot of counseling together. We've done work separately. We've, um, we've gone through a lot in life. And so to be at a stage where we don't freak out, like we're just <laughs> at a place where it's, this is what it is. This yeah. is what it might cost us. This is what we need to do. This is what he needs. Uh, just felt, it felt better than the first time we went through it when it was just the dark, night of the soul and you're just feeling your way through it and you're scared. I mean, you're really scared. And that first time I was nervous about suicide. I was, it was, it was pretty dark. And so mm -hmm. he was, um, he was in a different place this time. He, he knew how to ask for help. By the time he told me like that I'm sinking, I'm sinking fast. He had already called for help. He had already called his doctor to get an appointment. He, you know, so all of that just felt so different. And I guess a sign of, of maturity and, 20 something years of marriage and everything. It just, I don't know. I was really proud of him. Absolutely. Okay. This doesn't have to do with the story, but this will make you laugh because I never told you this. The first if yeah. gathering a gazillion years ago. Yeah. Um, I see him walking around and there just weren't a lot because it was smaller back then. I don't yeah. see a lot of dudes walking around and I would see him walk around. And finally I said to someone there, who is that guy that's always walking around? Like, is this allowed? And someone said, oh, that's Jenny's husband. <laughs> <laughs> he gets to do whatever one. he wants <laughs> and it's real but he i was like why is, why is this guy walking around in places he yeah. shouldn't be walking around i was so clueless it was like yep. instagram was newer so i didn't yeah. i didn't know what your family looked like as well so sure. funny yeah who is this guy yeah. should he be that close to her <laughs> <laughs> he's he sticks by me it's really cute i mean yeah. it's really he might as well be my speaker host he doesn't though because he doesn't hand me lipstick or uh, mints or anything, but yeah, he, he could, he's just, it's really cute. He, yeah. He, he's really the he best. He stays close and he knows everybody there. So it's fun. Like that he stays so close to me because I know he's got lots of people there. He'd love to be visiting, but yeah, yeah it's pretty great. No, he's the best. Okay. For you, I know you go through a long period of research. I love that about you. What are some of the things when you were in the research phase that surprised you or some things that people may not know about emotions? Yeah, a lot. I mean, I, I think first it's important to just say that we are really hard on our emotions, all of us, and we learn that from lots of places. We learned mm -hmm. that from our parents probably growing up, and not that they had necessarily ill intention, but, you know, if your kid's crying, you're kind of like, it's okay, don't worry about it. Like, yeah. it'll be fine. Um, and that's just kind of how we get through the day, and, and I did the same thing. So we all learn things from our parents. We all are learning things from the way people treat us when we are angry or sad or scared. And so that's really where most people's education stops. I mean, just experiential. How were emotions treated in your home? How are emotions treated in your marriage? Um, and that's, that's what you get because nobody's really teaching you about emotions unless you pay for therapy. And so when you get to adulthood, you know, we we're sitting here going, okay, I don't like this feeling. I don't want this feeling. I, and, and I, I don't think I should be feeling this. Right. The other place that I think has influenced a lot of our views on this is the church. 
And we've got the world who is follow all your feelings and whatever you're feeling is the most valid thing. It's the truth. And just that's, that's how they view it. And I just am super compassionate to that because if you don't believe in God, of course, happiness is your goal because what else is there? I mean, Paul even says in Corinthians, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus, basically, he says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, eat and drink because tomorrow we die. It's mm -hmm. if there's not anything after this, then make the most and pursue all your as much as you can pleasure and happiness because there's nothing else. So that's how they've lived. And that's right. That's understandable. But then you've got the Christians who have kind of said they're dangerous. Emotions aren't aren't um, truth. Don't listen to it. Um, don't listen to them. They, you know, they can lead you off a cliff. Um, so there's this whole other mentality and things that are being said and liked a bajillion times on Instagram. <laughs> and that's not true either. I mean, that emotions are very valid. They are telling us something. They're signals. In fact, they can be very, very trustworthy at times. They're, they certainly can lead us off cliffs if we put them in the driver seat. But I think I was most surprised just by how many, as I talked to so many people in this project, how many people were uncomfortable, even just with the proposition that I make, which is God, no, um, emotions are good. They are not bad and they are not neutral. They are good gifts from God given to us to help us process a very messy world and to connect us to God in a deeper way and to connect us to each other in a deeper way. That's the purpose of them. Yeah. And when you use them for that purpose, it's unbelievably powerful. And you actually have such a full, more full life because we are missing our lives. We numb out. We get um, so down that we think the only way to fix it is to cope with, with it, with a million things that we all, you know, tend to go to. We control it. We try not to feel it, you know, whatever. We all have our different ways. Um, the three most common that I learned just in talking to people was we cope, we control, and we conceal. Mm -hmm. And so those three, everybody was like, yep, do those, do that one the most. And so I do think we all have found a way to navigate it, but it isn't necessarily the best way. Yeah. And I think for so many of us, if we aren't doing well emotionally, if our emotional health is a little bit off, it leaks out on everyone we're around. So we may love Jesus. Yeah. We may do everything right, quote unquote, right in that way. But if we're hurting, yeah. if we're limping emotionally through life, it affects our witness. It affects our relationship. It affects so much. We can do a lot of damage out of our own hurt and out of the emotions that we haven't properly worked through accidentally yeah. when we do truly love people. Yeah. I mean, this happens to all of us where we overreact about something and we're mm -hmm. like, where did that come from? Why am I frustrated like that? It doesn't feel worthy of that. And we all do it. And that is actually a signal of there's something else going on. And when you dig into that something else that's going on, you find out that, you know, there's there's all kinds of things that are stuffed in the boxes of our hearts and lives <laughs> and and that we've we've not dealt with. And and that's okay. I mean, there's so much grace for all of this because it's just life is hard. And I think that's why I what I hope people take away from this is just so much compassion. Compassion from God that he's not disappointed in you, that he's not judging your emotion. He's so proud of you that, that he's the parent that's like, of course you feel sad and angry and disappointed. Of course you do. Like this is, this is not as it should be and this is not as it will be. But, but we picture God like scolding us and mm -hmm. angry because that's what our own brain is doing to ourselves because that's what we learned. And so, you know, I think that's what I hope everybody feels when they read this is just this huge exhale of kind of, I mean, genuinely, of course I feel sad. Yeah. Of course I feel happy about this situation. And and it's not right for me to even judge that because we sometimes can even judge our happiness because we think we shouldn't be happy because other people are suffering. So mm -hmm. whatever it is, that judgmental part of us, it's doing its job and it's protecting us and it's learned. Um, it has to do that for a lot of reasons. But my hope is this book helps that part rest and helps everything else come up to the surface. Because like you said, once – once we begin to untangle all this, you feel like you're happier, you're peace, more peaceful, you don't snap as much, you're not as irritable, but you don't totally know why. But it's because you've worked through things that 
puts you right on that edge of snapping or however you do it, right? As some of us fight and some of us fly and whatever your thing is, yeah. Yeah, that's so good. So the process of writing the book, researching for the book, going through the book, did you learn anything big about you or did it change you in a way? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> – I'm a little embarrassed at how bad I am at this, and I'm honest about that in the book. But, I mean, the whole time I'm writing and the whole time I'm researching, it's all I'm thinking about. You know how this goes. It's – you don't – there's no other thoughts in your brain. Like, you're you're thinking about this subject for a year of your life. And so that whole year, it was so funny. My husband said, Jenny, I don't even know if you know you're doing this, but all throughout the day, every time I talk to you, you tell me how you feel about the <laughs> smallest little things. Like, you say – I think I'm feeling a little worried about da 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 da. She said, "You say it all the time now," and he said, "I've had to learn that. Oh yeah, you're just in the middle of this, and it's kind of awkward, but mm -hmm. just r go with it." And it's not like we don't normally talk about our feelings, but I think I was on overdrive, and I think it was kind of like a muscle. Like I've got to keep working this because I tend to numb out, I tend to stuff, I tend to fix, and so doing this book was so good for me because. It made me just pause way more to notice my body, to notice my thoughts, to notice my um, feelings, and I'm not good at that. So the whole experience was so good for me, and, and my kids would say so good for them because I became a better listener. Yeah. I became more sensitive. I didn't try to fix all their problems. I bit my tongue and said, I bet that makes you feel sad. I can understand that. Instead of, well, if you would stop doing da da da, <laughs> <I know. laughs> which never goes right or well. So, yeah, I think it changed me completely, and I think it surprised me how bad I am at it. I knew, um, I actually think this part got cut, but I wrote about um, how everybody—I don't know—they may have left it in there, but I think it got cut. Um, maybe I put it back. I can't really remember my relationship with the book and how, where this went, but <laughs> I know how um, it is. it's a blur, but yeah, they cut a lot. Y'all the first draft is always the best draft. The first draft 100%. I cuss, I, I mean, it's a mess. I shouldn't say that, but it's, <laughs> it's juicier. It's way yeah. juicier. I have wise editors that are like, yeah, no, you can't say that. <laughs> um, but I do feel like, you know, everybody laughed at me. Like my closest friends, when I said what I was doing, they literally, their first first reaction what? was to laugh wait to write the book yeah. on emotions yes because I'm really that bad at it wow like I'm this I'm really bad at it it's crazy how God calls us to tackle a subject because we think oh I'm gonna help other people with this subject but God's like oh we're gonna we're gonna deal with you first we're gonna do some work yeah wow. so so I grew a lot and yeah I I've I've learned a lot I'm better. <laughs> I'm definitely better and that's isn't that just the most fun thing about it that you can get better like that that gives everybody, I think, a lot of hope. Like, gosh, I can grow in my maturity emotionally. I can grow in my health emotionally. That's yeah. it's possible. That's great. When um, twenty twenty happened, the end of twenty twenty, beginning of twenty twenty one, I completely numbed out. I still ran my company. I worked with my clients. I, you know, I was a pretty decent wife and mom, if I if I could say so myself. Like, I did everything I was supposed to do, but I was completely numb. And mm. I remember praying and saying, God, what do you want me to do? I, I couldn't have even verbalized that I was numbing out. I just knew something was wrong and I didn't feel any passion for life. I, I felt like I was going through the motions every day. And he said very clear to me, get help. And you know how the Lord will just give you a couple of words, but he'll illuminate all the details of it. And mm. for me, it was get back in therapy, get a business coach again, get somebody in here cleaning your house. It was, it was get help. I had just, I had let the pain of the pandemic and, and my kids had health issues and just doing everything on my own, stuffing all my emotions inside, not grieving anything that had been lost and just numbed out. So when you write about feeling numb about the same time period, I wonder if it wasn't just me and it wasn't just you, it was. Oh, for sure. Tons of you all. It's so funny because you think of the pandemic and you think of quarantine specifically and everybody was at home and baking bread and in their pajamas and, you know, for, for months. And so you yeah. think that should have kind of felt restful. Well, that 
I wasn't restful. We were reeling inside. You know, that was exhausting. And even for a lot of us, our work picked up in that season as, as pastors, as leaders, our decision making, our what are we going to do about this? How are mm-hmm. we going to handle this? Um, even just wanting to pastor people well. So, you know, that was a really accelerating time for 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 me in life and work. And so, yeah, I think my time came a little bit later than yours, but it was similar. It kind of just, I was super numb. I wasn't excited about work. I wasn't motivated. And I, I was confused because I did love work so much. That was so that that's what led me to start meeting with a counselor and and meeting with a little small group of leaders that we still meet together and it's just a monthly gathering. It's actually who I dedicated the book to because I think they helped me feel and go back to some of the reasons I was checking out mm-hmm. and and not to fear pressure, not to um, ignore my body, like to to pay attention. It really, yeah, that was the beginning of that work. For me that's great how long did it take you before you felt like jenny again oh that's a good question um i would say we we had been meeting probably a year when i started really believing like wow this is working when i felt triggered by work or something that would have normally triggered me and made mm-hmm. me anxious and I didn't feel it anymore. And I called Dr. Thompson. I was like, what just happened? What, why did this happen? Why don't I feel anxious? You need to tell me like how – I'm such a – I need to know how it, that happened. Like yeah. what, what was it? Because it feels like magic. And he was like, you just weren't alone anymore in your pain, in your fear. Mm-hmm. And so your fear could calm down. And I'm like, oh, that's really precious and deep. And then – I head into this project and I do all the research and it's so cute. Like there's these little neuro pathways that break with trauma and then they build back together and the way they find their way back to each other and to repair is if you aren't alone in your pain, which is just other language, you know, counseling language for mourn with those who mourn and blessed are the poor in spirit and Mm -hmm. blessed are those who mourn because there's this sense of they get more of God. Like the connection with God is deeper um, and the connection with other people is deeper when you when you do that. So it actually does scientifically. For all, any of you out there, there that are like, I don't want to feel my feelings, and I don't want anyone else to feel them, I will just say it changes your life. Somebody emailed me today or messaged me somewhere, and I was reading it this morning, and they asked me, they said, I just feel like I keep exploding. I just feel like I keep – like." we're not supposed to live with the spirit of fear. I know fear is okay and that we can feel it sometimes. Like, how does it ever go away? How does it not take hold of you? And the funny, ironic thing is, is you feel it. And you go back and you go, where does this come from? And you you untangle it a little. Yeah. And as you do, you don't tell yourself, stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. <laughs> like, that doesn't work. But as you begin to heal these parts of you that need healing, mm-hmm. which God can do, And you can do best in community with other people. It really does change everything. It's so good. I remember the first time I ever learned about how things are traumatic for people when they don't have anyone to process with, when they're Mm -hmm. alone in the trauma. And it's worse than any kind of anything that can happen to you. You can have the smallest thing happen to you and it happens to you alone and you can, and you are not okay. And, And it confuses you but you are not okay. And you can have the hugest thing happen to you, but you are surrounded and you have people and they are comforting you and they are safe for you and you can be okay. It really is, it is the defining thing that, that, that defines how traumatic something will be. Yeah. And people don't talk about it. That's, it's so important for us to know for ourselves. It's important for us to know how to parent um, because it's a guarantee that we'll never say to our kids, yeah. Stop talking about it. You're fine. It's not a big deal. Because just like you said, if it's a little deal and there's they're alone in it and they can't process, it's a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge deal. And, you know, we just – I am so excited for people just to get a better understanding of it, just to understand what to do. This guy uh, was a pro- is producing a show that I'm about to be on, and we were talking about the, the layout of everything and 
and it was it's, it's a secular show. I don't know that he's a believer. And he um, he at the end of the message, he said, "I need to tell you that I haven't known how to help my seven year old. He's super emotional." And I feel like I've just been trying to strong arm all these emotions out of him. And your book landed on my doorstep a week ago. And I, it's like changed the way I parent. And I just pull this him up on my lap now. And I tell him, like, of course you feel sad about that, buddy. Like, that makes sense to me. And he said, it has changed him emotionally. And it's changed our relationship. He is wiping tears, like running down his face because he felt hopeless. And so there really is hope. Like, we really can be better parents. We really can be better friends. We really can be... Um, healthier for ourselves and and be freer Um, this is there's a path for healing and the scripture lays it out and the science lays it out but it is not by dismissing and demonizing our emotions right why do you think for so many people what has the research shown you on why dealing with our emotions is so scary for people oh that's such a good question well it's insanely vulnerable and Mm -hmm. awkward so anybody that has ever grave crying with someone and it didn't go well, like that's going to make you never want to do it again. So it doesn't always go well. Mm -hmm. Um, It also is, it's the most sacred parts of us. So our tears, our anger, our fears. I mean, these are, these are the deepest things in us that we often don't even articulate to ourselves. And so what I did in the book was, and this felt right to me in light of everything else I read, (laughs) because I didn't find anything exactly like this was to build handles, like, okay, what do you do? I'd read books right. about, like, what are the emotions and what do you feel and all that matters, and that's in there. But the, to me, the most important thing was what do you do? What do you do when you feel afraid? What do you do when you feel scared? And, and so I built a process, and it's super simple, and it's to notice what you're feeling. And sometimes that is one of the reasons people don't share because they just they haven't even paid attention to their own body or their own heart or their own mind. And that's okay because it's busy and life's hard. And but it, that really was the starting place to notice what is happening. Or am I okay? Am I not okay? And then to name it, to find a word for it. <laughs> and so I took the way everybody divides it differently. But I liked four: so sadness, fear, anger, and joy. Those are the four most common. Almost every other emotion fits somewhere in those. Mm-hmm. And so I built an emotional chart with the words that to be really specific um, about fears, like, do I feel terrified or do I feel worried? You know, just Mm -hmm. to give it more clarifying language and then to, so notice name and then it's feel. And for some people that feels like, I don't know how to do that. And I will literally walk you through it. Like, this is how you feel. And, and for people like me, that would be helpful for a lot of you. It's like, I feel too much. Well then, what does it look like to feel in a healthy way Mm -hmm. and actually do it in a way that's productive? And then of course, and this is by far the most important is you share, which is why I found myself sharing so much with Zach. Now that was awkward. I don't think you tell everyone your every feeling (laughs) that is, that's not realistic and you're going to beat down the people that love you. But the important ones, the big ones, once a week, one, you know, twice a week, my best friends and I kind of have this text stream that's like, okay, I need y'all. And we live in the same neighborhood, so we will just meet at a local restaurant sometimes within the hour. Like, hey, I'm, I'm not in a good place. And they say, okay, let's go. Let's, let's meet. Oh. So we really have like an emergency system set up where we're sharing pretty big feelings pretty quickly with each other. How can people identify the people who are safe for them to share with? Yeah, that's always so hard because so many people are scared. So I always say just – you go to coffee first you be the initiator um you be the initiator and second drop just a little bit like don't share your most vulnerable thing with somebody early like just try sharing something and see how it goes and if they nod and lean in and say me too i feel that way too um that's a that's probably you can you're safe to try more and share more but i don't think we just try to dump on on friends i mean I'm really grateful Find Your People was my last book and it came out before this book because I literally can say to the person that's like, I have no one to share with. I wrote a whole book for you. Um, (laughs) So go back to it because it really is the very most important part. Like being this connected emotionally with a few people, not a lot, just a few, is how we learn and unlearn things. It's, It's how we learn to feel compassion. It's how we learn to notice 
what's happening in them, what's happening in us, how we learn to share it, how we learn to receive it, how we learn to be there for other people. So it really is the most transformative part of it all, but it also, of course, is the scariest too. Yeah. Do you feel like that's easy for you, Allie? I uh, honestly, I, I'm an overshare. So yeah. I get burned Good. more by going, let me tell you all the details. And I think for me, it started when I started writing books because I remember yeah. thinking, I don't ever want someone to read my book and then find out something about me or yeah. meet me and I'm not me. So I think yeah. I, made a, I think I made a decision in 2015 that I'm just going to put it all out there and see what happens to the point where I have to reel it back in. So one of the things in Find Your People that I drew out was like, okay, you have your inner circle, which is like two to three. And yes. those are really the people that are going to follow you weekly. You're going to know, they're going to know emotionally what, what's going on. They can tell you like, okay, this week, Jenny's doing pretty well. She feels good. Yeah. Um, this week she's, she's in pit. She's, she's struggling. After that is, you know, it's just hard. It's like, you just got to have a few people that just commit to each other and say, yeah. we're going to do this life together. And these are the ground rules. Jessica Honiger is the one that put, pulled together our little co cohort of leaders. Mm -hmm. And right. she's so feisty. And she kind of just set the rules. Like, this is how we're going to do this. And if you don't want it, you don't <laughs> have to come. But this is how it's going to go. And I was so grateful. I was grateful to not have to be that person. But yeah. I also was just grateful that she was so bossy. Um, she would hate I said that. But she knows it. And, hey, and bossy and women rule the world. I love a good bossy Somebody woman. had to be because yeah. we're all strong and bossy. So yeah. she had to boss us back. And, and it built something really beautiful. And we thank her all the time because we've all enjoyed it so much. But she really had to work hard to make it happen, I That's feel right. like, in the beginning. Yeah, and it's it's so important to have that safe space and safe sisters mm -hmm. to share with. Okay, fun questions yeah. for you. Okay. Enneagram, or do you still identify as a three? Has anything changed? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know um, when we talked last time that I said I was a three, but I would say I'm definitely a seven, eight. I have oh, a lot of did I get it wrong? I I'm must a seven, have eight. I look like a three. You but do. My, my meaning, my motivation and meaning, or my motivation comes from meaning in life and sucking yeah. the marrow out of life, not yep. from achievement. Um, I don't, I don't especially love achievement. I, I hope this book does really well and hits New York Times. But if it doesn't, I'm fine. Like I, I find a lot more meaning from like the dinner we'll have as a family and celebrate and the, um, the people it helps. So yeah. I don't think I'm quite a three. No, you're Some not. Days. Well, that I made the mistake with you that everyone makes with me because everyone thinks I'm a three. Yeah, um, what are you? I'm a, I'm a seven, but yeah. everyone assumes I'm a three because I, I think do it's a lot very of stuff. interchangeable. I've heard. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I've got a lot of eight. I've got a lot of bossy in me. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay, what about a song that you're loving right now? Ooh, um. I'm loving everything by Stephanie Gretzinger. Is that how you say her name? Yeah. Close like enough. I, she makes me. Taya has a song "Christ in Me." I mm -hmm. think it's called. Or it's that's what it's about. That yeah. one I've been playing a lot. Really good. It's a good one. What about a TV show or a movie? Ooh, I've been watching Madam Secretary, and I've loved it because I I haven't watched it in years and years and years, but. It is so good for leadership. Like, I feel like I'm learning so much from her as I'm leading more and more things. So, yeah, I I appreciate that show. Nice. I'm I've watching that right it. Now. I'll put it on my list. Really good. It's kind of what boring. If you, you know, I love all the global news stuff, so mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. But it's probably kind of slow. Most people would probably find it slow. I'll take a slow show. Sometimes a slow show becomes an emotional support show. It, that's how I feel. It's like yeah. West Wing. It's like one yeah. of those shows you turn on at night. You're not going to get stressed out even though big things happen. But you feel like, okay, there's good people in the world leading the world even though they're pretend, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I can do this. Um, what about a product that you got recently that you loved? Oh, um, good question. Let me think. Oh, you know, I was a sucker for the Instagram and I got that o, is it OG stuff, the like – sticks and i like them a lot like the oh, stick seen flash what do they the do? Stick bronzer and the stick highlighter it just yeah. makes makeup so fast and easy 
I think it's O-G-E-E is what O-G. it is. Okay. We'll link it in the show notes. Yeah. This it's is cool. I mean, it's kind of expensive, but I had a gift card. <laughs> so I mean, it's like a hundred something dollars for like a little package of. Yeah. I'm sure you could find the exact same thing cheaper, but. <laughs> hey, the good stuff. I like it. The good stuff always works better. That's what I, yeah. I, I, I was just saying recently on the show. I wish I could tell 25 year old Allie, you only have to buy a fourth of the good stuff. It's worth it. Right. It's worth it. Right. And you'll keep it forever. Yep. Well, this is so great, Jenny. Well, tell us why they need this book, first of all, and of course, where they can find you. Well, I hope I hope that you will feel like glad that you got this book because it makes you feel understood and that you will feel the compassion of the Lord toward you and the compassion of me and the compassion of others for what, wherever you are on the journey of your emotional life and maturity. And I hope it's just helpful. I hope you feel like, gosh, this just gave me handles that I didn't have and a healthier view of my emotions. And I also hope it makes for better parents and for better pastors. I hope pastors read it. I hope it makes for better friends and roommates and all the things. That's awesome. And we can find you at Jenny Allen. Jenny Allen, J-E-N-N-I-E-A-L-L-E-N.com. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming back on the show. Wish you the best of luck with the new project. Thanks, Allie. Pretty great, right? You know what's about to happen. I'm going to give away five copies of her book. Tag me and tag Jenny on Instagram stories, and you will be entered to win the book. You'll also be entered to win the book if you are subscribed to my YouTube and you have liked it and you leave a comment. Okay, let's move on to the coaching segment of the show. I want to continue this coaching series that we've done on confidence before. It's such an important topic that, like I mentioned, I want to keep revisiting it and building on it because you know the real truth about confidence is that confidence doesn't come from thinking about it or wishing that you were more confident. It's all about taking action. Every time you step up and show what you're made of, you feel stronger. This isn't just talk. Your confidence grows with every success. The exciting part is, as you keep doing things, you're not just getting better at at your job or the things that you're doing in life. You're becoming tougher and more adaptable. You learn how to handle risks. You learn how to tackle challenges. And you celebrate when things go right. One thing you've probably heard me say before is life doesn't get easier, but you get stronger. So the things that used to take you out before don't take you out anymore. Every move you make, every new idea you try out, it all adds up. You start to see that you can do bigger and bolder things than you ever imagined you could. That is the magic of building confidence step by step through taking action. So if you're ready to boost confidence, here's a little homework for you. I want to give you different scenarios for where you are in life right now and how this could play out. If you're starting something fresh, maybe you have a new job or you're in the beginning stages of building something new, dive in with little steps. Listen to that inner voice and take smart, small chances. Each small win will build your confidence. Remember, every big journey starts with a simple step. Now, maybe you have a new idea. Start with a whisper, not a shout. Test the waters with a small project or a trial run. Every little success is a step up on the ladder of confidence. Just like a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, your big dream will kick off with one small action. Now, maybe you're in the phase of life where you have felt knocked down or you've recently had a setback. It's time to rise up slowly. Like healing a sore muscle, you want to stack up tiny wins to get back on your feet and feel more confident. Step by step, you will get stronger. Maybe you feel like you're in a rut or you do have pain because you kind of lost your confidence because of something. It's time for a mini makeover. Pick one small thing that you can change today. Maybe it's waking up 15 minutes earlier to journal or take a different route to work. Maybe it's cleaning out a drawer or cleaning out your inbox. Tiny shifts can lead to big changes in how you feel and how you see the world. Remember, a little spark can start a great fire. This is how it's going to be for your confidence. Let's just stack some small wins so you can rebuild it after a setback. Now, the third situation is maybe you're on a winning streak. Like all you do is win. This is your chance to aim higher without risking everything. Chase your dreams with a bit of daring, but make sure you keep your safety net. You're building big things one move at a time. Maybe for you, you're feeling like you're on top of things, right? It's time to level up. 
Think about that dream that's been on your mind, maybe writing that book or building an online course. Start small, but think big. It's all about balancing bold moves with smart planning for you. You've got this foundation. You're doing great. Now it's time to build the next thing. Okay, let's talk about recommendations. I did finish the first season of Silo with Rebecca Ferguson. I told you about it, and I loved it. It's really great. I can't wait till the second season. It makes me want to read the books, and I don't really read fiction, but it's that good. It makes me want to read the books. Okay, what am I moving to? One of my sons chose Masters of the Air. Phenomenal. It's another Apple TV show. Apple just has all the money, and they're putting all the money into amazing programming. It is it is along the same lines as Band of Brothers in the Pacific. So it, it's that if you like Band of Brothers, you're going to love Masters of the Air. Somehow Apple got it because uh, I think Apple just had the deep pockets. And it's a true story during World War II of the American 8th Air Force, a group of bomber pilots. I think they were there. They got there in 42 and they served till 45. Austin Butler is the main lead. Here's the thing. That boy is still doing the Elvis voice. His character is from Wisconsin. Um, so you don't have a Southern voice from Wisconsin, I don't think. Um, and Austin was born in California, but he sure does sound like he's from Mississippi half the time. It makes me chuckle. Like Elvis is in his soul, and he's always going to have a Southern accent now. <laughs> but it's on Apple TV. Give it a shot. I think I think you'll really love it if you like that sort of thing. Um, and you know what I like? I like that you're here. I like that we have this time together to invest in ourselves every week because an investment in you, in your spiritual health, in your emotional health, and your professional success benefits everyone in your life. I believe in what's inside of you. I believe in the work that God is doing in you and through you. That's one of the reasons you're here every week. You're learning something that's going to help you get healthier, to live the life that God is calling you to and improve life little by little all the time. What I know to be true is that God has created you to stand strong and bring something special and unique to this world that only you can bring. So keep stepping up, keep showing up, keep loving well, because you know the truth. You can't break a woman who gets her strength from God. And I love to get to coach and equip you every week. I'll be back with you on Monday, and I hope you have a great day. Okay, now final segment of the show today. I am bringing you, I don't remember. Here, I got it. Let me stop. And that's it. We're done.